I went by bike from New Jersey into Canada. That's a thousand miles up the Connecticut River Valley alone. And the bikes, foot pedals, no, no gears, they didn't have gears. It was just a bike bike, you know, and they, that a kid uses and whatnot. And they had American youth hostels and about every 20 miles, every 15 miles, I think it was. And half the time I skipped the 15. I took, you know, a leap to the second sometime or other. And you'd ride with somebody and there'd be somebody at every hostel and whatnot. I came back and my parents had no idea. I mean, I had a lot of freedom, not because they were believed in freedom. I don't know, it, just, it was the way you did it. Nice Jewish families at the time or so on. You let your kids be or something like that. I don't know what it was. But as long as I didn't fuck up, that was it. I was okay. And um, I probably told some stories. I don't remember I was going with somebody. I think originally I was going with two or three people. And then their parents, of course, said, no way, are you kidding? <laughs> so I went. I was going to meet so-and-so at some place, and that was it. It was exciting. I was riding with somebody from the last hostel, some guy and kid. You know, I think a couple of years, three, four years older than I am. And it was pouring rain. It was very early in the morning. We were coming into St. John's Very Center. I can see it as I'm talking. Zoom, it's a full screen. And coming down this real big hill. And uh, uh, he's leading the way, going like bat out of hell. And some person, I couldn't tell who, started to cross the street and then stopped and then started. And he this and that. The bike. He jammed on the brake, the bike flipped, hit the guy, and killed him. I came second and into this pile up and whatnot on top of it. I woke up, I was in the hospital. I never saw him again. He was all right then. And I was told that the old man had died, an old person trying to, and they tried to, and I was released sort of right away and the thing. Somebody had seen it as it came down. So I'm just sitting there, I'm almost a thousand miles from home, and that's the first death of my life, and going, it was pretty intimate. I was born in uh, Newark, New Jersey, 1924. Uh, don't remember too much about it. And uh, I do remember at five years old, we were in Europe for eight months. My father was uh, a uh, executive in a very large fur dyeing and dressing business. It was international, A. Hollander and Son. And he'd go over once every year and so on every once in a while take his family. In this case, it was going to be a long trip. So we did nine months in Paris. This was at age five. I remember that, by the way. Uh, so saying nothing of remembering youth, not quite. That was a goodie. And we came home, and then uh, on coming home, uh, we moved to a place called Milburn, New Jersey, and then to Maplewood, a suburban, uh, in the normal flow of people beginning out to the suburbs. This is before there were burbs, I guess. And that was it. And we, I stayed in, in Milburn, uh, and then into S Maplewood, South Orange, uh, sort of step up kind of thing. And I went to school system there, but school didn't even register on me the whole time. I was there, but yeah. <laughs> and that was it. And when I got out of school, after a very mediocre, you know, high IQ, low, low scores, <laughs> not paying any attention to any of it, I don't know why, I just was bored. And uh, this was before the time they got around to, you know, attention deficit or whatever, <laughs> the various diseases they have now. And um, I went away to college, a uh, place called Hobart. I stayed a half year, and then I volunteered for the 10th Mountain, the ski troops. In volunteering for the Army, uh, the wise and the wherefores, uh, you know, I'm looking from this standpoint, but I think probably what it was, one, I didn't like school. I was doing well in college, actually. Uh, complete different. I found the attitude different. It's a 500-person school, and I had a nice feeling to it. Uh, I was playing lacrosse with them, which I liked. And, uh, but I saw a brochure that, uh, you know, a bunch of guys sitting around a fire and Mount uh, whatever it is and K-1 
in the state of Washington and with their white spots and also a few women off to the side. <laughs> and something was appealing. And also, I had done my first skiing up there, which was cross-country skiing, really. And I was going out every day, sort of, and kind of liked it. And, but between get, wanting to get out and in 1943, this was 1942, we were in the hot and heavy of it all. I mean, it was all, everything was going worse, worse, and worse yet. It hadn't made the turnaround. And so there was a lot of patriotism for real in the air. No comment on today. In finding out what the ski troops were going to be, it was going to be out in the mountains, and it's all in the wilderness, and this and that, and a lot of tough things. And compared to what I had been doing, uh, this sounded like, you know, that Mount Washington I had seen all those years before and whatnot. And I was going to be drafted in. Everybody was going to get drafted one way or the other. And so I put in my three letters of recommendation and all that and showed up and never regretted it. It was a great choice. My first taste of adventure, uh, I guess, was a bike trip at 13, uh, at 1,000 miles. And the next taste of it, really, was uh, the joining uh, the ski troops. It turned out to be that, too, in spades, uh, beyond any conception. I mean, it really worked. A hundred and 18 pounds and carrying 90 pound packs as a daily thing, you know, five miles a day, 10 miles every three days, and then 25 miles of marches with a 90 pound pack, winter and summer. And so I, I don't know why I loved it, but I did the whole thing. I loved it up in the wilderness and even the war overseas. I had no regrets about the entire thing going. Came back, I did. <laughs> I went into the suburbs again. <laughs> From New Jersey, I was in some kind of a, uh, I don't know what they call them at the time, the induction camps where you do a little training and they find out where they're going to ship you. Well, I stayed there for three months, which has got me a PFC, and nobody ever gets a stripe while in a uh, uh, camp like this. But they couldn't find where Camp Hale was in the ski troops. I mean, it was something so new and whatnot. They finally sent me out, and I came up the train from Colorado Springs to Pando, which is the stop above Camp Hale, where the camp was. Whoosh! These are the first look at Rocky Mountains. I had seen Mount Washington in my dreams out there that one time, but this. And uh, yeah, in the altitude, we were at 10,000 some odd feet, and you're immediately, even as a kid, go oh, like this, and you're getting down to Army routine, and it was a tough, tough routine. It, the camp itself was, uh, well, the whole thing, uh, you're out in the wilderness every single day, hard routine, like any other Army thing, but a great lot of esprit de corps. Well, hi, I'm Gino Hollander. I'm uh, 81 years old, I was born in 1924, and I'm a painter. You know, talking about the ski troops at Camp Hill, and we were ski troops before we were 10th Mountain Division. Uh, they hadn't even come to that name yet. We were a collection of people, young kids, most of us, uh, from all over the country. It had to be a volunteer thing. And once you're in, you couldn't get out either. There was nothing you could volunteer for except the Paris, Paris ski troops, something like that. Or, you know, parachute jumpers and nothing else. Uh, most of them came out of college because the only people who were doing any skiing were in college. And then all our instructors, almost without uh, exception, were out of Europe. People who had been evacuated from Europe got out one way or the other. And they were the mountain climbers, they were the skiers, and they became the reconnaissance that trained us. But every known skier, guys like Dick Durance and whatnot, uh, who passed away, I guess, no, not too long ago, uh, he had shush Mount Washington, and all these guys were in. Anybody that ever skied or mountain climbed was there. But most of us, we hadn't done anything except we had an outdoor tendency or a want for it, and we were accepted for it. And they gave it to us in spades, you know. Uh, average IQ was so high that nobody could apply for OCS, which was a 120, I think, based then, because the whole thing was over 120. And so that was it. You were in the ski troops. And our games were not elite, but I mean chess, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was quite a group. Until, until they ran out of, by the way, 
people volunteering. And then they, then they inducted them from all over the place, <laughs> right? As usual. <laughs>